Good morning. May I warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name to our service on this day that the Lord has made. And I pray that we would know the presence of the Holy Spirit with us as we lift high the name of Jesus, as we pray and as we lean upon the Word of God. Just like to make some announcements. And first of all, can I draw your attention to the COVID update on the back of the news sheet? Um, hopefully, over the next few weeks, there will be some changes made to this. The four main churches are meeting again, uh, approaching the end of the month. And there is hope that there will be some further guidelines released as a result of that meeting. Um, so you'll see there at the bottom, there's a little sentence which is different from what we have normally read on the back of the news sheet. But as I say, we hope that over the next couple of weeks, there'll be some more information to share with you regarding restrictions and guidelines, etc. I'd also like to extend uh, a welcome to someone who's no stranger to us in Craig, and that's to uh, Thomas, Thomas Clark here next to me behind the communion table. Uh, Thomas, as I said before, is exploring the possibility of applying to be an accredited preacher of our church. So we are trying to give Thomas the opportunity to have some experience conducting worship. So today, Thomas is going to conduct the service, and then I'll preach later on. So thanks very much again, Thomas, for doing this today. And we do continue to pray that you would know the Lord's guidance uh, as you explore this. Uh, in the news sheet itself, uh, the youth Bible class continues in between the services today at quarter past 11 for P7 and up. Uh, the PW are delighted to be able to begin uh, meeting again with a, with a one-off meeting, um, this time uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the church. All ladies of the congregation are very welcome, and the contacts are there should you wish to make contact in advance. The Zoom Bible study continues tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. as we explore the Gospel of Luke together, and everyone is very warmly invited to take part in that. Even if you hadn't had the opportunity to do so yet, you're still very much welcome to join in uh, to that Zoom Bible study. If you're interested, please let me know. Summer Midweek Walk. The walking group invites you to a walk on Thursday the 24th, which will follow careful COVID-related safeguards. After meeting in Strangford for coffee, we will walk around Killard Point. And as the news sheet says, this is a walk where there's no climbing or any difficult navigation. And then the opportunity to end with a bite of lunch together. If anyone would be interested in that, if they please speak to Robert McNair and let him know about that. This is not a change from the Saturday walk that normally happens. This is just a, a, an experiment and a beginning again of the uh, walking group. So the, the full announcement is there for you to read. I would ask you to do that and let Robert know if you're interested in coming along. Uh, next Lord's Day, we gather at 10 and 12 as normal, uh, this time to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Um, and at both of those services, there will be um, a retiring offering in aid of the Benevolent Fund. A date for the diary. The Evergreens are having an afternoon of music and readings on Wednesday week, the 30th of June, at 2.30pm in the church. And we are being joined by Tea and Talk. Uh, as the announcement says, the Evergreens and Tea and Talk are coming together. And if you would like to attend, again, the information is there for you to make contact with Carol about that. The last announcement is just to say that recordings of our weekly church services um, of, uh, on a CD or a DVD could potentially be available if anyone would like to request or can think of anybody who would benefit from that. If you're interested at all in that or want to talk to me about that so that we can get a little list put together, please do that um, and we can get on with organising that. Uh, they are all our announcements. Let us gather our hearts and minds together as we worship the Lord. We come from scattered lives to this sanctuary to seek our unity in the spirit, to seek the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to seek the peace of God the Father. God's people have gathered 
let us worship him together. We will now sing hymn number seven, When Morning Gills the Skies. Let us pray. Lord God, the wonders of your creation, the splendor of the heavens, the beauty of the earth, the order and richness of nature, all speak to us of your glory. The coming of your Son, the presence of your Spirit, the fellowship of your church. Show us the marvel of your love. We worship and adore you, God of grace and glory, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God of mercy, God of love, in humbleness of heart, we confess our sins. We forget to love and serve you and wander from your ways. We are careless of your world and put its life in danger. We talk of our concern for others but fail to match our words with action. Teach us the words of the prayer you taught your disciples as we pray those words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. morning. Uh, Our reading today is from Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 to 33. It's a bit of a lengthy one, but stick with me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. Place the ark of the covenant law in it, and shield the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table, and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand, and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the ark of the covenant law, and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the courtyard around it and put the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it and all its furnishings and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar and it will be most holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate them. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics. Anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to a priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. He took the tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and shielded the ark of the covenant law as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle, outside the curtain, and set out the bread on it before the Lord, as the Lord commanded him. He placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting, opposite the table, on the south side of the tabernacle, and set up the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain, and burned fragrant incense on it, as the Lord commanded him. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings, as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Thanks be to God. Unfortunately, there's no boys or girls here this morning, but I thought I would just share the children's address to the big boys and girls. Uh, We're going to talk this morning when Jesus said, he is the true vine and we are the branches. So this is the vine. This is the vine and you have the, the tree and the branches. So 
to paint the picture, the branches need the vine to have a place to be. They need to be fed and nourished, to be strong and to be healthy, to grow. Just like those branches, we all need Jesus to have a place. Having a place, so I have a place in my home and in school and in work. If I didn't have a place, I would have nowhere to go. And this is what Jesus says. In the kingdom to come and a purpose for our lives now, without him, we would all be lost. To be fed. We all need food, but when we have our breakfast, it doesn't fulfill us for the rest of the day. We need lunch and we need dinner. Jesus says, if you come to him, we will never hunger. Given what we need to live and thrive, Without him, we would only have what the world gives, which is always lacking. To be strong. He is with us when things are tough. Whenever we fall, bang our head, or graze our knee, we always look for our mums or dads for support and comfort, just like with Jesus. Without him, we would only have our own strength, which isn't enough. To be healthy and grow. Having good things makes us healthy and grow up. To suck up Christ's purity and goodness so it fills us. God leads us to be more and more like Jesus as we trust in him. Without him, we wouldn't have what we need to be acceptable before God or be the best we can be. We're now going to sing hymn 552, Take my life and let it be all you purpose, Lord, for me.
The closing chapter of Exodus is beautiful. In many ways, Exodus is a difficult book to read. It starts off with the exciting story of Moses and the freeing of the Hebrew slaves. And then all of a sudden it scuttles into chapter after chapter of detail about the making of the tabernacle. This large and ornate tent that God would use to dwell with his people. It might not be the most exciting read when we get into those chapters, but it is so central to our understanding of who God is and what his nature meant for the Israelites and then by extension, what it means for us today. Exodus 40, the graft is completed and all the elements are made and forged. Moses has inspected everything and found them to be made just as they should be. And he begins to now set them up to prepare the priests in line with the Lord's instruction. The tabernacle has gone from God's instructions to complicated work to being actually completed from vision to reality. The tabernacle now stands. And at the end of the reading that Thomas shared with us, we hear these heartwarming words, Moses finished the work. And while our reading was long, I wanted you to get the real sense of what had been accomplished, what had been achieved, what had been hard won through blood and sweat. This mission had finally come to its conclusion. And do you notice the rhythm in the passage that Thomas did very well? This rhythm where Moses does something, it's explained, and then it is noted that he did as the Lord commanded. Moses is instructed to do something, he does it, and then it is remarked that he did it just as the Lord commanded. Eight times, in fact, in the passage, we see this rhythm. Moses did as the Lord commanded. It was through his obedience that this great mission was brought to its completion. It was through the obedience of his fellow Israelites that this mission was brought to its completion. It was through obedience that the Israelites could now move on to the next stage in their mission as the people of God going forward to take possession of the land promised to Abraham. It was through obedience that they could do so. It was obedience that had got them to that point. And it was obedience that they would use the tabernacle to show and remind themselves of as a symbol of what it meant to live for and obey the Lord. That's what the tabernacle symbolized. It symbolized the fact that God was in their midst, that his holiness, righteousness and purity dwelt among the people. And it was really true. God had done it. God had brought together this thing that he had promised. He had delivered it. He truly was their God and they truly were his people. And while obedience had got them to that point, it would be obedience that would maintain that relationship with God, their link to him, their bond with him, their purpose and their identity. The tabernacle was a place where the sacrifices were made in line with God's instructions, where the people had to demonstrate their obedience by ensuring that they brought the correct offering by assuring that they came for the correct festivals in the way the, the way the law described. The tabernacle acted as the domain of the priesthood. Those whose role it was to explain and teach and exercise the law so that all the community would enact the regulations that God had laid down. From the tabernacle then flowed this key notion obedience had got them there it would be obedience that would sustain them and it would be obedience that would lead them on to the new things that God had for them now let's fast forward to the ministry of the Lord Jesus in John 15 we have the opportunity to listen to Christ teaching using as he often does vivid imagery to explain and reveal his character to those who would hear him speak He describes himself as the true vine. He describes himself as he who is in intimate relationship with the Father and therefore desires that those who would follow him would have that same intimate relationship with him. 
Jesus is the vine and the people are the branches. Without the vine, the branches wither and die only to be discarded. But with the vine, there is much fruit. There is much opportunity to grow in the knowledge of who Jesus is and what that means. There is much opportunity to live a life of healthy spiritual growth that impacts the world around us. The key, says Jesus, to this knowledge, growth and impact is obedience. It is through obedience that a person comes to know God and his promises. It is through obedience that a person remains within and sustains a close relationship with the Lord. The picture may look a lot different from the tabernacle, but the concept is exactly the same. Obedience leads to the conservation and flourishment of our relationship with God. Through it, we are his and he is ours. As the Israelites, through obedience, could call on that mantra, I will be your God. And you will be my people. Christians, those who love the Lord Jesus through obedience can call upon this beautiful idea that Jesus speaks of. That if we remain in him, he will remain in us. Listen to what the Lord says in John 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last Jesus earlier in the same sermon explains that this obedience is a display to the world of the truth of God's nature and therefore glorifies God as a result. Just like the tabernacle was a symbol of obedience that gave God glory, so our lives as Christians are to be like little tabernacles that through obedience to Christ we reveal and honour God. Jesus says it like this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we, like the Israelites, are called to live lives of obedience. Jesus in chapter 14 of John says so plainly when he simply remarks, If you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And we can't accuse Jesus of being unclear. He is calling for a devotion to him and to his Father, a commitment and trust that would manifest itself in a life of obedience. That life of obedience would protect and nurture a relationship with God that would display the nature and wonder of his kingdom to the world and be a reminder to us of our identity as those who belong to God and in turn those who have the God that belongs to us. Did you ever sing when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favour he shows and the joy he bestows or for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I remember singing that hymn often in Castlereagh, 
And while I don't think the word, the word happy is helpful because it's too easily misunderstood and too subjective, the beautiful idea of the hymn is still very powerful. It's sound and a wonderful idea that when we trust and obey, for there literally is no other way, we will find fulfillment, a life that is purpose-filled, a life that is truly alive and not just going through the motions. A life that is blessed because we live a life even when things are difficult of those who belong to God. There is no other way but to trust and obey. And while we can hear the call to trust in Jesus and his saving works, sometimes we get a bit stuck on the second idea, obey. What does Jesus actually command us to do? He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But what are his commands? Well, there are plenty. But in this passage that we have touched upon, Jesus focuses on one particular command when he says this. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. What does Jesus mean by that? How has he loved us and how are we to do what he has commanded The problem is that the idea of love has been so warped and twisted by the culture that surrounds us. It is often talked about. We are bombarded with love songs and with online articles and we are bombarded with the media, not forgetting the the daily news on the latest love interest of a celebrity or someone who is rich and famous. However, for the most part, all of this is just frothy nonsense. When we compare those examples to the love and the idea of love that is displayed to us in Scripture, Our references to love constantly surround us. More often than not, it is not the type of love that Jesus commands and shows us and requires of us each day as we seek to follow him. You see, the Bible points to a love that is sacrificial, God-focused and truth-concerned. Sacrificial, God-focused and truth-concerned. Love today is all about me, my rights, my preferences, my desire, what I want, what I crave, what I demand. Me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. When the culture pronounces God is love, what it is really saying is that love is God, which is a very dangerous thing to say. Love is not God. God is God. And he has revealed to us the nature of love and righteousness. For without that revelation, we would never have known such things. God is love, but love is not God. With that in mind, we are pointed to love that is about others, our neighbors and our fellow disciples. How do we love them in a sacrificial way? Christ was willing to die To give his life for us when we did nothing to warrant such a thing. We are being called to love in a way that honors and mirrors that. By being willing to put ourselves out, to bear with and genuinely care, to see value in others, especially those that are hard to love. Because that's the real test, isn't it? It's the people who are hard to love that reveal how sacrificial we are willing to be because it's easy to love the people we like. We are to love others in a way that is focused upon God, not ourselves. We are prompted to ask ourselves, how can our relationships, our interactions glorify God? After all, Jesus tells us that this is what we are to do as we love each other, glorify God. That prompts us to consider where God is in our everyday lives. Is he central in our marriages? our relationships, families, friendships, our interaction with our work colleagues, our neighbours? Is he at the centre of those situations? If not, it is our role to display him, to show ourselves as his disciples, to love others in a way that leads them to see who God is and what it means for their lives. On Father's Day especially, this is hitting home for me. For those of us here who are fathers, the most important role that the Bible gives us is to model a relationship with Christ and to lead our children into godliness, striving so that our legacy is children who love the Lord. Nothing is more important than that. 
And this leads then to the final idea. And that is that loving others in a way that is truth concerned. Jesus showed great compassion and kindness. But he didn't ignore sin or the seriousness of it. His compassion and kindness drove him to tackle immorality. To call out unrighteousness and to expose evil. He did this so that those who he loved would know the truth and they would see the captivity sin had placed upon them and that by repentance and faith they would break out into newness as Jesus calls, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Love that is truth concerned does not condone or excuse sin. It is love that has a heart for God's word, a deep longing to see it read, understood and lived by, a desire to see Christ exalted in the world so that men and women, boys and girls, are graciously, compassionately, yet firmly challenged to see their need of Christ and the truth, morality and righteousness that the Bible gives to us. True Christian love unifies believers, but this unity is not a unity that denies the truth. Christian love and truth are inseparable. They go together, hand in hand. So, to love one another as Christ loved us is to be sacrificial, to be God-focused, and to be truth-concerned. That is the obedience that we are prompted to live by. That is the obedience that Jesus gives us. And he gives us loads of everyday examples of how that looks. And if we had time, we could explore those. But the idea is so very clear that as little tabernacles, we bring glory to God and maintain and flourish our relationship with him as branches of the true vine when we live in obedience to God. So as we pull these strands together, Two wee tiny things to leave with. Don't think I said today that our relationship with God is solely based on our ability to be obedient. Our salvation, our standing and our relationship with God are based upon Christ and his work upon the cross. And that is central for us to understand. But the second wee thing to take with us is That it is our obedience and our faithfulness to Christ which allows this relationship that we have with him to flourish and be nurtured and grow in the way that it ought to grow. So our standing is based in Christ, but our relationship can deepen and flourish through the obedience that we show to God. Think about that tabernacle. Think about the tabernacle all set up and ready to go. And then Moses and the priests walk away. The lampstand is no longer a flame. The bread on the table is mouldy. The incense is burnt out. The altar is absent of sacrifices. And the priests, as I said, are gone. They're maybe even asleep. There is the Israelites not living out a life of obedience to see that relationship nourished and grow. Their standing hasn't changed. But their relationship hasn't nourished. It hasn't grown. And are we not in the very same place sometimes is it not time for many of us to blow out the cobwebs to waken up to relight the lampstand to bake new bread to replace the incense to start up the sacrifices and to set out as the kingdom of priests that we have been called to be to make the lord known in this world and to display that through our obedience to glorify him we are called today to re-engage with jesus to seek him afresh so that he may be first in our hearts as a people who for the sake of the kingdom show him to the world as those who are obedient to his word and teaching, who are sacrificial, God-focused and truth-concerned. Trust and obey, for there's no other way, for Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. If we remain in him, he will remain in us And we will be fruitful to the glory of our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for who you are. Help us to not be that serving dish that is bought, but looks too good to be used. So it's put in the cupboard 
and stays there all its days. Help us to be that which sits on the table, which is used to display the wonder and beauty of the fellowship that there is with you. Help us to be those who would go out and really desire to be obedient. Not because we want to earn our salvation, but because we want you to be glorified. Help us to be those who would be sacrificial, focused upon you. Those who would be concerned with the truth of your word. We thank and praise you for this and many things. And we ask that yours would be the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray for the church, the world, and one another. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the church, the bright lamp of faith, her ministers and people, and this church. May the King of Angels protect her, keep her, and save her. For the world we pray, the creation of God, its land and sea, its peace and prosperity. For this government, Lord, we pray that all parties find a resolution to the problems set before it. For those who are ill, we pray, and for those who suffer, may the good shepherd who knows and loves his sheep make them whole and well, active and content. For those who work, we pray, and for all who weave the patterns of this world's life, may the King of Grace give to their labour, growth and kindly substance until the day of gladness comes. For those we love and for ourselves, we pray, may the guarding of God be theirs and ours until together we come in the High King's house in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will now sing hymn 538. He who would valiant be against all disaster. And as we leave the sanctuary today, let the guarding of the God of life be on you, the guarding of the loving Christ be on you, 
the guarding of the Holy Spirit be on you, every day and night to aid you and unfold you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.